Good evening, everybody. Um, and thank you for turning up to uh, this month's uh, December meeting of the British Tunnel Society. Before we get underway with our presentation, uh, unfortunately, recently we uh, lost one of our colleagues, John Foster, and uh, Roy Slocum's going to come and say a few words. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, for anyone who knows John uh, better than myself, uh, I apologise in, in advance if my few words don't do him uh, full justice, but we're endeavouring to put together a proper uh, obituary for tunnels and tunnelling and tunnel talk uh, later. I should also say that the conversation less than half an hour ago with, with uh, our chairman went, uh, has somebody given you some notes to speak about John? And Rod said, no, will you do it? Do it. So, so <laughs> it's, it's a bit, bit, uh, bit ad hoc. Um, um, John, John was born, was born um, um, beginning of April, April 1947. So like myself, beat the tax man. Probably like myself the only time in his, in his life. Uh, he began his career as a student apprentice uh, with a steel company in Workington. And that student apprenticeship involved uh, an honours degree course in civil en uh, sorry, mechanical engineering. When he graduated, he joined Nuttles, uh, on, initially on the Kraken uh, Hydro Scheme in Scotland, but also on the Mersey Tunnel uh, with the, uh, the big Robbins machine there, the Elius Aqueduct, uh, where they were setting, uh, at the time, world records with their 100-inch drives. And also then, uh, in the early 70s, uh, he was a mechanical engineer on the Bentonite, Bentonite uh, Shield trials in South London. Uh, his involvement with, with funneling machines in, resulted in him transferring to, to Priestley, who were at that time Nuttles, uh, a subsidiary of Nuttles. Uh, that then led to uh, involvement in the product design and production of, uh, of tunneling machines for Italy, Czechoslovakia, and other places, and included the, uh, the first attempt of the channel tunnel, or not the first attempt, the attempt in the 1970s. He later, with the demise of Priestley uh, himself and, and Richard Lewis, uh, joined Markham in Chesterfield uh, with a view to revitalize uh, their mechanical tunneling uh, division. Uh, he later moved on to, to Decon down in Bridgewater as managing director and was mainly involved in production of, of small machines. But he also, based on his experience from uh, the Bentonite machine trials, uh, he led the, the Howden design team uh, for the product design and production of four machines uh, for the UK side of the Channel Tunnel. In 1987, he set up his own consultancy as Mechanised Tunneling Services and became a TBN consultant uh, worldwide. Uh, quite a lot of jobs in UK and, uh, and Europe and quite a lot in, in South America. Um, his CV would then include literally hundreds uh, of TBMs uh, I saw a, a copy of his CV up to 2011, and there were over 200 then. So, uh, and in the last 10 years, uh, he would have done a lot more. He retired, uh, in fact, uh, late 2018, uh, closed his consultancy um, with the, uh, the declared aim of, of playing more golf. Um, several of people have said any time they tried ringing him after then, he'd be on the golf course. He was certainly very well respected in the industry. I think everybody would say about John uh, his honesty, his integrity, his, his sheer knowledge uh, of what he was doing, and also his sense of humor. Uh, I've never seen a photograph of John where he didn't have a big grin. Uh, so I say, very good. Um, his funeral is uh, tomorrow. For anybody who didn't know and wants details, I'm sure we could, we could help furnish that. Um, I'm sure uh, a lot of other people who knew him well will be there. Right, we will proceed with our uh, evening's presentation. Uh, this month, it's Thames Tideway Tunnel Update 2022. Um, we have quite a team from the uh, Tideway group here. So rather than myself go through each person's uh, biography, um, everybody's going to introduce themselves as they get up to do their part of the presentation. Okay, over to you, Jim. Okay. Uh, 
Good evening, everyone. Th and thanks, Rod. I'd just like to thank uh, the BTS for, for inviting us to, to present today. We have come, looks like, full force. Um, it's good to see so many familiar faces in the audience that I haven't seen actually in some time, so it'll be good to catch up uh, afterwards. But quick introduction, um, I'm the delivery director on Tideway. I've been on Tideway going on nine years now, so really pre-development consent order planning application where I worked with uh, a few people in the audience. I've been on Tideway since in various capacities. Before that, I worked on the London 2012 Olympics, um, helping deliver that program. And you might notice my by my accent, I'm not originally from here. Um, I'm from the states where I, where I delivered several major programs in, in Texas and in the southern region of the U.S. Um, so really, we're, we've got a few topics we want to cover uh, today. And again, we'll, we won't introduce everybody now, but we thought it'd be good to give a quick overview of all the good work that's happened on Tideway over the past year. We have a few special topics, um, some of the highlights over the past year, some of the challenge we, challenges we've run into and how we solve those. Um, Jad's with us today to give a little bit of an overview of the system commissioning plan. We, we are still in construction, but we're quickly approaching the commissioning phase. And then James will, will lead off on, on what's happening in, in 2023. Well, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir on some of this stuff, but just in case there's one or two people in the audience who, who aren't familiar with Tideway, I thought I'd just provide quick overview. So Tideway, 25 kilometer long tunnel from Acton Storm Tanks in the west, westernmost site, generally follows uh, the path of the River Thames to uh, Abbey Mills Pumping Station, uh, where we connect into uh, an existing tunnel that's been built in commission, uh, commission the lead tunnel uh, down to Becton uh, Sewage Treatment Works, uh, which has been upgraded as part of the Tideway. Um, Tideway uh, works. We have two connection tunnels, the Greenwich Connection Tunnel, Frogmore, um, slightly smaller in size than the main tunnel, about five, five and a half meter internal diameter. The main tunnel, 7.2 meter uh, internal diameter. And what the project is all about is cleaning up the River Thames. So as most of you probably are aware, um, the existing uh, sewer network within London designed, uh, built by Sir Joseph Bazalgette uh, back in the 1860s. Uh, it's done a great job over time, but is, is significantly over capacity. So um, I think in 2014, the statistic is 64 million tons of, of sewage uh, rainwater spilled in directly into the, the River Thames. So um, River Thames is polluted. This tunnel will capture those sewage, the majority of those sewage overflows um, you can see the graphic there, Sir Joseph Bazalgette's um, uh, lower level sewer one that runs along the embankment just next to the underground uh, box there. Essentially, it's a very simple scheme. Um, we have along that route 21 shafts and interception, uh, interception chambers that connect into that existing sewer network, uh, take the sewage flows that would normally flow into the River Thames, take them down typically a culvert, down a shaft, and into the main tunnel where gravity takes it to, to Abbey Mills uh, pumping station. Um, so a simple scheme, very similar to Basil Jett's original scheme, which took flows from um, uh, the, the Lost Rivers of London um, eastbound. Um, we started construction 2015 after we got the development consent order and the Mayworks contracts in place. Um, we've been, uh, I think we've actually given this update, um, what, three or four years now. Um, so this is, we're still well, in, well into construction. Um, we're 84% complete, uh, which a lot of people are saying that's close to the finish line, but it's often that last 10, 15%, which can be the hardest. So um, we're, we're, we're still going full throttle at mo most of the sites. Uh, the main tunneling is 100% complete. So the primary drives, um, we completed the last two sections in east uh, late springtime. Um, We've completed the secondary lining, so for, for the Tideway Tunnel, we do come back through a second pass. Uh, we have to install a, a secondary lining within, within the tunnels to meet the uh, design criteria. We've actually finished that secondary lining in, in the west and central sections, and we've just started in the, in the east section, which we'll touch on in a bit. Uh, of those 21 shafts, we've uh, secondary lined 18 of those. Uh, we've completed nine of 10 of the smaller connection tunnels. And something we're really proud of, and it's probably been reported in previous presentations, is because a lot of our sites are you know, almost directly on the River Thames or, or very close, we, we really want to maximize the use of the river to transport materials to and from sites. Part of that's part of our consent 
planning application, there are certain targets, but Tideway, I think, has done a really good job in trying to maximize and actually go over those targets. So uh, to date, we've been able to uh, deliver 5.5 million tons of material uh, by, by river, so precast concrete segments for the tunnels, um, some of the TBMs, obviously the soil risings to, uh, away from the site. So what that's done is taken 300 plus thousand uh, HGV loads off the road, which has reduced the risk to vulnerable, um, vulnerable users of, of the road, so pedestrians and, and, and cycles, cyclists. Uh, health, safety, and well-being, so it's been really a priority from Tideway um, from the get-go. Um, we really wanted this to be a transformational program, so we've set up, um, you know, a great induction system, um, the standards which are really world-class. This is often that point of the program where complacency can s slip in, um, and what we've seen over for 2022 is a transition from, you know, heavy civils tunneling to now we're getting into mechanical, electrical instrumentation, uh, architecture landscape, which brings on a different set of risks. So a big focus in 2022 has been actually managing that transition, um, understanding we're entering into a new risk profile and updating our safety plans accordingly. Uh, just do a quick whip around the site. So Wes, I won't steal uh, Steve and Alexi's thunder, but um, a big milestone uh, over the last few weeks has been completion of the secondary lining of, of uh, the tunnels in the West area. Um, BMD, who are the a joint venture in the west section, have done a really great job. Quality is, is really good there, but um, Steve and Alexi will go through that in a little more detail. Um, what I wanted to focus on today is actually that, that transition from tunneling civils to actually we're, we're starting to finish off some of the sites. So um, this is pretty exciting. This is one of the King George's Park, which is one of our first sites to complete. We're going to start doing some work site testing, but we're actually planting trees, doing soft landscaping, hard landscaping, and might not be able to tell from this image, but a big legacy commitment that Tideway have made is to, you know, hand over sites that are, that are really t top class in terms of architecture landscape. So um, this will be one of the first sites. Um, we're not going to wait for commissioning to hand over all the sites, so we're looking at what areas we can actually get back, uh, give back to the public and local authorities. So this will be uh, one of those first sites. On West, you still have a lot of civil works to go. So the Acton storm tank, which is uh, the picture to the right there, is a shaft. That's a vortex generator coming down, so most of our shaft sites have these vortex generators, and that's when the sewage flows come, comes down the shaft, we need to uh, dissipate some of the energy of those flows coming down, so it basically creates a swirl motion so that um, the forces aren't too strong when, when, when the sewage effluent uh, hits the bottom of the shaft. A central, so central um, tunnels both complete, both secondary line uh, flow, who are the joint venture um, main works contractor there, again, doing great quality work. So those were big uh, milestones in the year. Um, secondary lining, I think, completed this summer. And again, like West uh, in Central, we have some sites that are, are getting close to completion. Uh, we have a number of sites on Tideway that are actually, we're building out into the river. So new, new four shore sites, creating new real estate, essentially in London. Uh, these will be all public realm spaces. So Victoria Embankment on the left. Um, uh, see the final river wall perimeter there. We're still working within a, a temporary cofferdam structure, which will be coming down over the next few months. Um, nice granite paving, and you can see the two ventilation columns up in the top left corner there. So those are our signature Tideway ventilation columns, which will be pretty common and consistent across the areas. And then Blackfriars Embankment to the right, that's our largest four-shore uh, four um, site that we'll be delivering. This is probably a couple months old, actually. We've covered over the shaft there. Um, started some of the architecture landscaping um, and flow had started removing the temporary foreshore structure there. And finally, I'll end on east. So east is on our critical path. Um, we completed the tunneling, as I said earlier, and uh, the team there are focused on now getting the secondary lining of, of the tunnel launched. Uh, CBB, who are the joint venture uh, partner there, who I think won, won an award last night. Dominic? Yeah. yeah. Um, are delivering these works, the shutter system on the left there, so that's a secondary lining shutter system that was similar system that was used in West, so this is supplied by their subcontractor Kern. Uh, they've got that mobilized set up uh, in the main tunnel there and, and, and ready to launch. They've actually been progressing with the secondary lining on the Greenwich Connection Tunnel for, for a few weeks now. So just want to give a quick snapshot, some really great progress across uh, all three areas. Uh, we will be progressing with heavy construction 
over the next year, which James will touch on a little bit more later, but in parallel to that, we are gearing up for, for commissioning and making sure we have all the plans in place to uh, have a smooth commissioning period. That's it for me. I'm going to hand over to Steve Lousley, uh, who's going to go through in a little bit more detail on the secondary lining in West. So thank you. Yes, the old boy, yeah. Hello, I was, I was looking there, hopefully there, when you came over. Hello, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, my name's Steve Lowsley. I'm the delivery manager for the Tideway West section of the project. So I've been on Tideway for four years on the same role. Um, previously, I was the uh, program manager for Transport for London on the Victoria station upgrade, the Tottenham Court Road station upgrade. And Alexi? Uh, I'm Alexi Bond. I'm construction director for B&B. Uh, I took over from Pete Layton about six months ago, and before that, I was a uh, construction manager looking after the secondary lining on the main tunnel. Uh, and before that, I did various projects, and this is my first tunneling project. So, yeah, we, so we just got some slides here uh, this evening on the, the, the tunnel secondary lining on, on Tyro West, which, as Jim said, we've, we've, we've now completed. So, a bit really just on the on the tideway route map and where we are in the uh, in the western section so we we run from um, Acton in the uh, in the west through to our kind of main tunneling and secondary lining hub over at uh, Carnworth Road which is number seven on the on, on the plan and then we pick up um, connections over at uh, Hammersmith Barn Elms Putney and then we've got a connection tunnel the Frogmore Connection Tunnel, which picks up two sites, King George's Park and Dormay Street from, uh, from Wandsworth. And in terms of the tunneling, as tunneling uh, elements of it, we um, have got just, over, just, uh, well, just under seven kilometres worth, uh, worth of tunnel. So we, have, as Jim also said, we've completed the, uh, the, the primary lining, which is a segmental primary liner, just over 300 millimetres thick. And we've now also completed the, the secondary lining elements, which reduces the diameter, final, final finish diameter down to, to six and a half metres. And like I said, really, we've then picked up various uh, connection tunnels with different techniques uh, from Hammersmith, Barn Elms and Putney, and then the Frogmore connection tunnel, which is a much smaller tunnel boring machine, a 2.8 metre diameter drive from um, Dormay Street and King George's Park in, in Wandsworth. So, in terms of the, uh, the tunnel secondary lining, so it's obviously to follow the, uh, the primary lining, the segmental tunnel, which provides the main structural strength and uh, water barrier. And then the secondary lining, the 300 uh, mil thick uh, concrete, which was um, produced with a batching plant, which Alexia will go through in a bit, uh, reinforced with steel fibres, and that's to provide the, the long-term integrity and strength against chemical attack and exposure to sewage flows. So, We've got a long asset life of 120 years in relation to the tunnel, and that's because we don't really want anyone to have to be going into the tunnel apart from very, very occasional routine um, uh, maintenance and checks. Um, and because we want to keep sure that the, the tunnel's uh, keeping operational and working for the, for the full 120 years and uh, doing what it's meant to do, which is to take uh, sewage away from the Thames and, and out for treatment. In terms of the secondary lining system, uh, we've got six shutters in total, which are, uh, are fully rounded and uh, hydro, uh, hydrostatic. Uh, they're, they're produced by um, uh, contractor Kern. So we have three uh, leading and three trailing um, uh, secondary lining shutters. And as you can see from the, um, the plan in the top left, they're installed on a hit and miss um, pour sequence. So um, in terms of each shutter, uh, they weigh 100, 130 tonnes apiece. And they're eight, 85 uh, metres long, and uh, they each take, in terms of the pour, uh, 55 cubic metres of concrete. So for a six-shutter pour, which is what we call like a pour sequence, um, that is uh, 360 uh, cubic metres in total. And we're trying to do that roughly three times uh, in a week during our, during our peak. In terms of how it moves, uh, we use a self-powered traveller, which has an onboard generator. And it kind of moves on a, on a rail system. There's some different methods which I think um, the eastern section are, are looking to adopt, but that's, that's what we used in, in, in West. 
And what that does, it kind of continues to move the shutter into its new position, and it also moves the rail sections to enable the advance of the shutters as well. So some interesting facts. Um, so in terms of the concrete uh, used in, in the secondary lining, we had a, a mammoth 48,000 cubic metres that were used. And, um, and again, we brought, and similarly for taking all the spoil and bringing in the sec segments for the primary lining, all of the aggregates for the, uh, for the secondary lining were brought in by bar barge. And in addition to all the good work on the, on the primary lining, we've saved over 8,000 lorry movements as part of that. Like I said, really aiming to, to do three poor sequences in the week, which I think maximum production was actually a bit over 1,000 cubic metres in a week. So some, some really, really impressive uh, production statistics there, really. So the uh, secondary lining system, again, I'd like to take you a little, little bit more through that. It operates with what we call spud bars, which provide the, uh, the pressure support at each end of the shutter back onto the, uh, back onto the lining of the tunnel. And they have to take um, pressure in excess of uh, 140 tonnes. So again, a very important component. And again, there's a bit more about spud bars later. And in terms of kind of the volume of uh, number of people and the resources involved in working on the, uh, the secondary lining, we had a kind of a peak of probably just over 200 people a day working on the secondary lining. So you know, a very extensive operation um, on top of the, the primary lining. Let's hand you over to Alexi. So uh, secondary lining system, so it wasn't just the shutter that was the challenge. We also had a, a concrete delivery system. So as Steve mentioned, all, all the, the aggregates brought in by Braj, and then we had a batching plant kept within, within the acoustic shed, uh, allowing us to batch 24-7. And that, that batched three cube loads, and that, that were going to go into a, a system of remixes with four remixes, each with six cube in it. And then we, we would test it for, for compliance with the, the specification. And then that would get pumped for the first time about 150 metres down into the, the tunnel uh, and, and we'd simultaneously pump from two different pumps and fill two uh, bullets or KVMs uh, in, in the tunnel. Each bullet held about 15 cube each, so a train load was, was about 30 cube of concrete. Um, that would then travel through the tunnel uh, up to about six kilometres, so taking anywhere between 30 minutes and 45 minutes to get to the, the logistics crossing. And then once at the logistics crossing, we would then test it again to make sure hand degraded and then d pump it into the shutters. Um, shutter six was about 350 metres from the logistics crossing. So you know, in total, we're pumping that concrete a very long way. Uh, it was a, a bit of a challenge trying to keep that concrete live and keep its quality all the way through into the shutters. And then the logistics of the system. So the, the logistics crossing was, was, was essentially a moving uh, crossing point where the trains could come on you could hold two trains at one time, any one time, discharging both simultaneously. And then on the top deck, it was dedicated to welfare to ensure the guys had somewhere to, to rest. And, and we also started fitting it out with workshops at the back to allow us to properly maintain and fix the shutters as they, they broke down. And then in between the logistics crossing and the shutters, there was a crane gantry. And this really was a key piece of equipment to make sure that we could clean the tunnel, uh, remove the TBM rails, uh, and, and do any final leak sealing and get, get any muck left, left underneath the rails out. It was also key for removing the waste, something that probably surprised most people was how much waste that was coming out of the shutters as a result of the poor, all the grout required to, to lubricate the lines to, to do it. It was, it was a huge amount of material brought back out, and this was the only way of, of moving it. And then in behind, we had two gantry systems uh, used to, to, to finish the, shut, to finish the uh, secondary lining, so a little bit of uh, concrete finishing and some minor crack injection. So no plan ever quite goes to plan. So some of the challenges we faced, uh, we actually did really well launching the shutters. And, and we, we start off in January 21, uh, and we're slightly ahead in March when we, when we launched the, the front shutters. And they, the pause on those went really well, excellent finish. Um, and then we launched the trailing shutters and pretty much immediately had some challenges. Uh, with, the, with the uplift from the spud bars, uh, each, each spud bar had, had over 140 tonnes on. And unfortunately, the first time we poured, some cracks appeared that were beyond the, the cracking limit. But had a number of issues on previous secondary line and on, on West. So this was something we were quite disappointed about. We, we put an awful lot of effort in to avoid it. 
Um, and th but this cracking was very different to, to the previous cracker we'd experienced, whereas before it appeared after the pour from shrinkage, this was a, a very instantaneous crack. Um, after a lot of investigation, um, researching a, a lot of parameters, we discovered it was really to do with the, the excessive load from the, the shutter, the secondary lining can, can resist it. Um, we developed a system where we didn't just wait for the designer to numerically prove that, but in collaboration with Tideway, we, we conducted a series of trials to very quickly determine the problem. There's so many variables that could have caused the crack. It, it was almost impossible to numerically prove it. So we actually deliberately progressed the shutters on um, to try and discover the problem. And the, the solution was to initially to install reinforcement, which has a whole number of issues towards durability and also program. And we eventually, through again, a series of trials and increasing the spud bar sizes, managed to eliminate that. Uh, it's quite a testament to the to the collaboration really between us that we managed to go from first crack to installing reinforcement in just two months and that included cat three check um, design assurance from tideway um, and actually working on how to install it and then it was only another two months before we completely removed reinforcement from the tunnel so quite quite a success and really it was all all key around working collaboratively together so we we solved the cracking problem and put our foot down on the accelerator only to find the machine didn't quite respond to uh, wanted to go faster. And unfortunately, the, the system wasn't quite up to, the, up to scratch to what we bought. We uh, had to develop a system of, of time and motion studies where every pour we, we looked at what, what was going wrong, where we were losing time. And, and initially, it was taking over a week to pour just one cycle and, and a lot of, lot of work put in by the engineers to record where, where we were losing time. And we developed a system of... of recording and then set a whole series of targets and, and measures that we would systematically reduce our cycle times down with the target down here of, of achieving a 36 hour cycle. We didn't quite get there uh, and, and really we managed to get down to a 50, 50 hour average cycle um, but we managed to do that in only about three, three months uh, and improve that shutter, shutter cycle. One of the challenges we also had was concrete supply. So our, our concrete mix has got a real challenge. It it's, needs to be high strength very early so we can strike the shutters, but also not go off um, for a long, as long as possible so we can place it in time. Uh, we were looking for it to, to last four hours to get it into the tunnel, but then looking to strike the shutter within 12. Uh, so very complicated with three different admixtures, three different powders, uh, and, and obviously the aggregate and the sand brought in from from the river. So it was very susceptible to very minor changes in the materials that we couldn't really predict. So again, using, using the data that we collected from every time it went wrong, we were able to develop a, a, a series of rules that just watching the, the slump flow and the water retained as part of the batching process, we could predict where it was starting to go wrong and change the mix. So we had a, a series of different, different mix additives all approved and the engineers could dynamically change that and that fundamentally changed the, the waste concrete that uh, we were producing. And then another one of the challenges we faced was, was the uh, logistics crossing was very, very tight to the primary lining. And this prevented us from putting anything in for the connections. Uh, we had three different connections, Hammersmith, Barnhams and Putney. All of them required a, a slightly different design and, and none of that work could be done until after the logistics crossing had passed. The logistics crossing was a fixed distance from the shutters, so that meant the shutters were stationary until all, all, the, all the work for the poor the connections were done. So you, you can just about see in this, this photo on the right-hand side the complexity of the reinforcement. If we had just done that first time, it would have, we would have been there for months. So we, we took a railway possession type strategy where we had a dedicated team planning it and, and pre-installed all the equipment beforehand, marked it on the lining, numbered it, took it back down again. And that approach actually allowed us to reduce what we planned to be delivered in two weeks down to a week on each of the connections, which, which was a huge saving. Um, and actually the finish, you can see that Hammersmith connection in the top right was absolutely excellent. That's, that's without any concrete finishing on that photo. So program wise, after, after having fixed the cycles, um, we, we re-baselined and as you can see, we, we pretty much 
kept to the delivery of the, the program and, and finished almost to the week um, on, on time. Post improvement measures, we, ha we averaged a 56 hour cycle, so 153 meters a week. And the best cycle we ever managed was 42, uh, 42 hours, which if we consistently achieved would have been 204 meters a week. Uh, it, it, throughout the process, we also worked with East to ensure we could pass some of our lessons learned onto East so that they, they could uh, learn from our, our issues and, and try not to repeat them. Good evening, my name is Anya Gonzalez. I'm the Tideway project manager. And this year it's been my 10th anniversary, 10th year anniversary on the project. Uh, before that, I worked as a temporary works designer in New Zealand after I graduated in Poland. And uh, since I joined Tideway, I've been involved in this site, King Edward Memorial Park. And I'm really, really pleased to share with you a little bit the story of it today. Uh, let's start by going back to the principles. Why do we need these works in Tideway? Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the northeastern storm relief sewer, discharging untreated raw sewage to River Thames approximately every second week for the last um, 90 years. The purpose of the works on site is to intercept that flow and divert it to Thames Tideway Tunnel. Uh, Kempf is the last interception site uh, on the way to Abbey Mill Pumping Station. This is where Tideway Tunnel joins with the Lee Tunnel and all the flow can be taken to Beckton Sewage Treatment Works. Um, this is how we are intercepting the flow at Kempf. We are building the underground chambers just in front of the existing outfall in the river wall to capture that flow and uh, divert it to the shaft. Uh, just before entering the shaft, the chambers become narrower and steeper so the flow can enter into vortex tube inside the shaft with sufficient energy so it can be safely transferred down 50 meters to the bottom of the shaft. Uh, at the bottom of the shaft, we have um, internal structures, the buffer wall or wheel wall designed to, to help to stabilize the turbulent flow and uh, deaerate it so when it enters uh, to the connection added, it can uh, safely join the west of the flow towards Abbey Mills pumping station. Um, when the tunnel is not available, the mechanical gates, penstocks inside the chambers are shut down and the flow can be safely discharged to the river to the opening in the new river wall. Uh, everything what we see is essentially built in the river and will become an extension to the park. Um, there was a very exciting, ambitious architecture and landscape design uh, prepared to um, follow the ethos of reconnecting people with the river. We can see the multi-level walkway around the circumference of the foreshore um, site to uh, help people um, connect better, enhance their experience, get them as close as possible to the river. We are also very uh, proud about uh, intertidal terraces, the um, triangular multi-level structure in spanning between the existing river wall and the new river wall designed to promote the vegetation growth in the intertidal conditions. Uh, it's been a while since we've been on site. Um, the first couple of years was dedicated to temporary works. To sink shaft in the river, we needed a, a robust dry walking platform and the cofferdam and ground strengthening was put in place to address all the construction loads as well as the ones from the operational phase. Um, after that, the two weeks arrived on site and over a year um, dug the deep walls, the deep foundations for the shaft, river wall, all our deep structures with uh, the shaft panels down to 75 meter deep. After that, we entered the excavation phase and installa installation of the secondary lining to address all the water tightness requirements. Um, the, we are now at the stage that we are covering our structures with the roof slab. We completed the connection added and um, doing, we, are, we have started finishes to the river wall uh, and scour protection. Next year, where the cofferdam will no longer be required, when that happens, we will be able to connect the new structures with the tool network, complete the architecture and landscape scheme, and enter into the commissioning phase, a really critical phase for this um, works on Tideway to ensure that all the mechanical, electrical equipment installed have been tested and the work site is ready to receive the flows. Uh, I will pass on now to Joe, who will tell you a little bit more um, about the shaft uh, and the secondary lining. 
Good evening all. Uh, my name is Jo and I'm the site manager for CVB at King Edward Memorial Park. Uh, so I've been on the Tideway project for just over five years uh, and previous to that all my experience is in the marine, civil uh, and piling industry in Australia. Uh, so just as Anya touched on, uh, so we constructed a cofferdam in the River Thames approximately five years ago to construct the permanent works which include the shaft, hydraulic structures and the river wall. Uh, we've been undertaking the permanent works just for just over uh, the last two years. So at the end of 2020, uh, we started shaft excavation, uh, which lasted just over six months, and we managed to excavate and transport over 25,000 cubic metres of material uh, via the River Thames, much like the other Tideway sites. Once we completed the excavation, we installed a base lab, installing six uh, prefabricated reinforcement cages, uh, anywhere between 25 and 30 tonne. Uh, and undertook uh, a pour over 24 over a 24 hour period that was just over 800 cubic meters of concrete. Once we installed the base lab, we started the installation of the vortex generator uh, using a propping system, which was the first of its kind on the Tideway E scheme at the time. Once the first vortex generator tube was installed, uh, we could start the secondary lining, which we did with a slip forming system, which was bespoke to the Kempf shaft uh, diameter as well as for the inclusion of the vortex, uh, vortex tube. Uh, at best, we were able to concrete up to two vertical metres uh, any over a 12 hour shift. Uh, so just after sh the shaft excavation work started, we started excavating for the hydraulic structures. Uh, this was challenging in itself because of the, the ground that we were excavating or breaking through uh, was through treated ground, uh, which was deep soil mixed columns, which were much stronger than anticipated. Uh, so this posed a challenge of us needing to excavate, break and simultaneously resequence works to construct the reinforced concrete works as well as accommodate for all the heavy plant and equipment that we had on site at the time. Um, as you can see in the corner of that photo, the 250 tonne crawler crane. Another challenge was excavating and constructing uh, in and around the hydraulically operated propping system which you can see on the right hand side. Uh, which was installed to support the diaphragm walls which were, which were designed to cantilever up to the point of where the hydraulic props are installed uh, and needed to be in place until the chamber was excavated and the base slab cast for support. Once the structures were excavated for, uh, we, constructed, we started constructing uh, three different chambers uh, simultaneously, designing and installing over 500 tonne of reinforcement uh, and building the concrete structures to high tolerances. Uh, such as the penstock wall, um, which many of the other Tideway sites have installed, and the tolerances we needed to achieve were between zero and four millimetres uh, to post-fix the cast iron apertures. And on the right-hand side is just some of the benching that we have in our hydraulic structures, which will serve to, uh, for the flows once they are re-diverted through, through, through our structures. Uh, and finally, we are now uh, putting the final uh, permanent works on the river wall, uh, which will form the facade of King Edward Memorial Park foreshore. Uh, and they include the precast concrete cladding, which have an ecologically enhanced pattern to promote marine growth uh, once this becomes a tidally affected area. I'll hand you now over to Tom, uh, my colleague, who will take you through the shaft added construction. Hi, my name's Tom. I currently look after the shaft and add it works at King Edward Memorial Park. I joined Tybo Project just over the, just under three years ago. I've uh, been here ever since. Um, previous experience to that was test station builds uh, and highway works. Today I'm talking about a 13 metre long connection tunnel which we've constructed at the bottom of the Kemp shaft. Started off in January, a uh, spray concrete line tunnel, starting off with a, a four metre internal diameter, widening out to roughly seven and a half as it joins the, the main tunnel. The reason for the tunnel was really program. Uh, essentially, the, the tunnel needed to be constructed. Uh, generally, the tunnel would go through the shaft, uh, as it's done at other sites, Deptford and similar. Uh, but in our case, we wouldn't have been ready with the shaft but to receive the, receive the tunnel, so hence uh, the adit was born. Excavation commenced uh, through one and a half metre freak D walls at the bottom of the shaft before continuing through a grout block, uh, progress into the main tunnel, Exodus. From there, we moved on to the SCL of the breakthrough, the sheet waterproofing, uh, and then culminated in three secondary lining pours, including a 125 metre cube collar pour, which we completed uh, just this Tuesday. 
As I mentioned, it's SCL tunnel, so it was constructed uh, obviously 60 metres down uh, in East London. The turret, turret of the excavation, therefore, was through chalk. Um, chalk was found to have quite high GSI of, of roughly 60 and, and over, uh, large flint bands as well throughout, which you can see in the pictures there. Uh, before we started the excavation, we completed probe drilling and resin injection through the D wall to test for water ingress and limit it uh, during the excavation. Uh, that was lessons learned from other sites, um, from Chambers and Greenwich. Uh, we, we did uh, manage water ingress well, but it was found to be slightly higher than we first thought. Completed the excavation there. You can see in the top right photo, initially in full phase advances before moving into a sequence of top headings and benches. Due to the small diameter of the tunnel, uh, plant size was limited, which posed problems uh, both for power available to excavate through the chalk as well as for access for excavation, both to the full extent of the top headings as well as to reach past the leading edge, particularly on the right hand side where we had quite a sharp increase in diameter. After consultation with the permanent works designer, Mott McDonald, a cutout in each bench was introduced, uh, which allowed us to step up in height to reach the top headings. Uh, and we also trialled different machinery for uh, increasing manoeuvrability and different capabilities. This worked well, but eventually, uh, during our second phase of SCL works, uh, we completed the benches in further broken down uh, sections horizontally and vertically. During the SCL phase, until the second line had reached full strength, the added and main tunnel segments in the Kempf area continuously monitored via means of automatic manual turtle station readings, laser monitoring, um, strain gauges, and such. Uh, this allowed us to review and act on real data, uh, which has proved critical during this work. Build-ups in the water pressure seen in the wheat poles drilled from both tunnels uh, would continue to be alleviated. As it would build up, we would see a, a build-up in pressure. Uh, and when we would drill and re-drill additional wheat poles, that basically became our primary means of controlling that and limiting pressure on the SCL tunnel, which is essentially temporary works. Uh, they, these would continuously seal up, and we would just have to manage that process through throughout the construction, which, which did work well. Each of the tunnel segments in the vicinity of the Kemp opening were installed with six shear cones on either side. Their main purpose was to hold the shape of the, the segments during excavation and the following on breakthrough. After we completed excavation uh, for the majority of the SCL, uh, you can see on the bottom left, we installed a timber works propping scheme on the back of the segments. That gave us the ability to change our sequence and uh, essentially complete the first two pores of the secondary lining before we'd completed that last uh, section of SCL work. Um, to allow the breakthrough and the, the final section of the secondary lining to be completed, we also installed six columns within the center of the opening. You see on the, the right-hand side picture there. They would hold the the tunnel open as we as we did complete that last SCL uh, and the breakthrough uh, each one of them was designed for a force of a thousand kilonewtons um, that propping scheme um, worked well obviously at limitations with, with space um, but you can see the locos passing by uh, unimpeded I don't have time to talk in detail now about uh, the various types of propping scheme and more than what I've gone into there but if anyone does want to touch base uh, after this on, on the methods that have been used and lessons learned uh, happy to share uh, those. Segment removal. So, uh, during the after the last port of secondary lining, uh, we had a job to remove a 5.3 meter square opening to create our connection. Generally, this would uh, be done with traditional chain blocks, uh, both fixed into the SCL and then into the tunnel itself. Um, due to the propping scheme, uh, as well as limitations we had on loading into the SCL itself, uh, this wasn't possible. So we devised this, what you can see here is a temporary uh, RMD frame um, consisting of three columns uh, as well as uh, beams across the top. Each one of those, uh, when, when four locations, we then have cantilevered lifting beams, both with two lifting eyes, uh, connecting up to two lifting points on each segment. Each segment was either pulled apart at a joint or cut, um, with the maximum being up to four ton before being lifted down into the invert and dragged out. This was something, a uh, challenge that we had to overcome. Um, I think uh, a testament to the Taiwei project and what it involves were trialing new methods and, and going against the traditional uh, ways of doing things can really work. It was something I think that never been done, at least on Taiwei before, uh, after initial learning curve. Um, it seemed to work very well. Um, and again, happy to, to share the lessons learned on that. Finally then, moving on to the secondary lining. So, as I mentioned earlier, we, we completed the second line in three pores. The first two uh, pores were 350 uh, diameter, um, using the barrel shutter you can see there, which we actually recycled from Tideway Central. 
Um, initially, it was a 3.6 diameter shutter. Uh, we designed and installed packers between each of the individual rings to then take that diameter out to 3.66 diameter, which was our, was our design. Um, the third pore was by far the most complex. You can see the, the first uh, section of it on the right-hand side there and the breakthrough in the, in the background there. Um, sheer size of the pore and the diameter of the tunnel made this, made this pore difficult. Um, in, where we're moving from a, a square, almost square, as we're joining onto the tunnel with the circle flying through, it created in the knees and the shoulders uh, areas of concrete diameter up to two meters. Um, this is a, a too large for a traditional spud bar. Um, so the, we then relied on both the lap into the concrete we'd already poured, as well as a fixing onto the, the propping scheme in main tunnel, which was another reason for that install. Um, the, another complication we had there was also to do with the large uh, area of concrete. Due to the heat uh, that would develop during curing, um, it would have gone over the 75 degree limit for delayed intrinsic um, cracking formation. So to overcome that, we installed a piped water cooled water cooling system. Essentially, we set up two tanks in the pit bottom. Uh, continuously pump water through those pipes. Um, it's actually still being pumped through now um, to remove heat from the large area of the concrete and avoid us going over that uh, 75 degrees. It's worked really well. We reached a peak uh, 53 degrees uh, just this afternoon, about two o'clock. Um, so we'll do that for an, another 24 hours until um, we'll switch that system off. Um, so yeah, another success story. Uh, def definitely something that's never been done on East before. Um, another constraint there with the system was the limit on pressure. So with the sensitivity of the area, the segments, the, the, uh, the actual shuttering system and the inability to find the large spud bars, when we're limited to a pore pressure of 56.82 kilonewtons per meter square, um, makes it difficult um, when you're pouring such a large area of concrete. Particularly in the, the weather we're experiencing at the moment, it's been particularly cold. So as the uh, temperature drops, our rate of rise dropped off dramatically. To overcome this, uh, and to attempt to overcome this, we installed eight pressure sensors within the, the shuttering system, on the outside of the shuttering system, four on the barrel and then four on the stop end, which we, would, we then tracked as we were pouring. Um, so at, using Syria as a guide, we then could increase our rate of rise and manage to take our pour time up from over 20 hours to, to less than 16. Um, so another success story there and a solution for a problem that Tideways overcome. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to Planning System Commission. Good evening, everybody. My name is Chad Goody, and I've been on the project for five years now. And prior to that, I was on the, the Lee Tunnel project. And prior to that, I was on the Thames Tidal Improvement Project, which are basically part of cleaning up the river and upgrading sewage treatment works to meet the new capacities. I'm going to take you through some of the stuff that we're doing for system commission now. And I, I just want to talk to you through what, what the system means. What is a system? So the component parts of what we're going to effectively put into operation, the connections with regards to the existing Thames water network and, and, and strategic pumping stations. Next aspect is what are we going to actually test and when? So the types of tests we're doing from now as, as we're installing equipment, the, the, the project phases as we go from installation of equipment prior to that factory acceptance testing and as we go into site testing, worksite testing and then the, the system itself. And then just wanted to sort of touch on what, what we're doing in 2023 in terms of the preparations for actually putting the system live. So just going back to the schemes themselves, I, I talked about the tidal improvement project. So the first stage or the first phase was upgrading the sewage treatment works. So the five sewage treatment works that discharge into the river, Mogden, Beckton, Crossness, Riverside and Long Reach. So those were upgraded to, to twofold. One is to, for the increased capacity from tideway, but also in terms of the effluent standard that was being discharged to the river. So the, the, the processes were all upgraded at Beckton. So my involvement was at Beckton, upgrading the Beckton works. The second aspect of that was the Abbey Mills or the Lee Tunnel connection from Abbey Mills to Beckton, which was the largest CSO that was discharging into the river. So this was the first phase of the project. And then we have the Tidal Tunnels. So that all joins at Abbey Mills 
which then takes the photo vector. Okay? And that's collectively known as a thermal target tunnel system. So that term you probably hear quite often with what, what, what's referred as LTT system. Okay? So the whole purpose of doing those three schemes is to regulate the operation and via the, the, what we call the London Tiger Tunnels Operating Techniques, which is set by the Environment Agency, we're gonna be controlling all of those works in terms of levels, process flows, and, 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 and putting it through the system. And then the commission is in, intended to demonstrate not just the, 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 it works in accordance with the operating techniques, but also fit for purpose. So we've built, all the, we've built the asset, but it needs to demonstrate that it's fit for purpose. So just going back to the familiar diagram of what Tideway is, so I'll just give me a bit of an overlay. It, the, the system includes the Tideway works, the lead tunnel and Tideway pumping station, and the, the two sewage treatment works at the end of that, which is Beckton and Crossness, and all the major pumping stations that feed into the Thames water network. <coughs> so the question is, how do we test the system? Now, as I said before, we're, we're trying to sort of integrate the existing network, pick that up and put it into the tunnel. But we've also got to be mindful of the Thames Water's existing system and how that operates. So what we're doing is we're, we're sort of making sure that the new assets have been constru constructed and they perform as per the design. So we've got the set criteria for the specification, the works information, and, and the design life, which I think is very, very critical in terms of making sure that the assets are suitable for what they're intended to do. The system functions as expected, which I think is, is a given that we, we need, we're building this system, but it needs to function and do what it's supposed to do. Can be operated as part of the wider trial network, so I think that's quite critical because a big interface is what the pumping stations are doing. When flows would go to the river, which we're gonna intercept now. And then again, automatically, so this should be a hands-off system. It should be just doing what it needs to do part of system commissioning means that we're testing all of those elements to do things on level control or you know, in terms of maintenance and everything else. So we're, we're making sure that functions as per the, uh, the operating techniques. And then, as I said before, the overall system is fit for, fit for purpose. So just giving you a bit of a, how we're doing this testing. So what we, what we started off with factory acceptance testing so we're, we're testing each individual of the, the, the components of the, the mechanical, electrical, ICA components in the factory. These, these are tested either individually as a, as a penstock or as a component, but then tested with an integrated test. So we're looking at, say, the penstock, the hydraulic units, and the control system. So we're doing an integrated test in the factory. So those factory acceptance tests are very, very critical for us to make sure that the, the, the the plant we've specified is fully to the, to the works information and also integrated into to the, to the overall system. So it's not an individual component. Fans, dampers, all of those sort of elements we're, we're doing in the factory. Once it's done in the factory, we're getting, uh, getting, getting onto site. So the last 15% that we mentioned on the project, the 15% is the micro element plus the architectural landscaping. So we're now in the stage of installing micro equipment across the site. And <coughs> the next stage will be actually physically what we call site acceptance testing. So we're now getting the factory tested equipment installed on site and we're, we're testing those components in the factory. So installed and then we're testing it back through the, the, the local control panel, through a telemetry panel at that site and then to top end SCADA. So we're basically now going back to where the control would be of these elements. Once we've got that, we then have what we call the LTT system itself, and that's what my role in 2023-24 is to, to make sure all of those components work across the 21 sites and we joined up, because at the moment the sites are all individual work sites and we've got sections, so we've got the west section, central and east. But the system is overall, and it, it ends up at Abbey Mills and Beckton where the controls would be then for Thames water for the tidal pumping, uh, tidal pumping station. So that's, that gives you a bit of a, an overview of the actual testing itself. Just giving you a bit of a, a flavor in terms of where we are on the project phases. So we started the planning process, I think back in 2010, 
11. Might be, might be slightly earlier than that, but I think that, that's where we were. So that was the sort of the planning and the strategic plans and detailed programs. We are currently in the, what we call the pre-system commissioning period. So this is where we're actually installing the equipment and the purple boxes show the, the worksite testing that needs to be done at each individual site. So the contractors, Thames Water, and the system integrator, various, various sites and projects that need to do the worksite testing. Once that's done, we've got to get, get a, a system that's integrated from one end to the other. So we have a, a, a system integrator who, who will be doing the testing from end to end. So basically from Acton all the way down to Beckton. And, and that is basically where the remote control or the, the control center will be at Beckton. So somebody at Beckton could control the whole of the system through the SCADA system there. Once we've got that, I think this is where the, the, the actual system commissioning tests themselves start. So we'll be doing various tests. So this, the, the system commissioning commencement date is a date effectively when everybody's out of tunnel, when we're now gonna start testing the system. And there's various phases of that. That would be sort of doing a dry test to make sure elements respond to alarms, signals, levels. So we're not putting flow into the first stage of testing. We're doing everything in the dry to make sure all of our control systems are working efficiently and the way should, they should do. We will then go into a second phase of storm testing. So we're now relying on the weather and doing various different storm tests. But because this is the first time the asset will be loaded with storm, storm water, we're doing it progressively. So we're doing it in various stages. So we have various different levels to make sure that the asset is being tested but not overloaded by a, a huge storm that could pull the whole system up in one go. So we're doing sort of various, what we call half tunnel tests, making sure pen stops are controlled, air management system works and the SCADA system works as well. And then eventually we'll end up with a full tunnel which, which is basically the levels that the EA have specified on how we operate the tunnel. Once that's done, we basically hand over. The handover is effectively a, a, a stage of giving the asset to Thames Water, who will be the operator. So at that stage, we've, we've, we've commissioned the system. We're now giving that asset over to Thames Water to operate going forward. The shafts and tunnels remain with Tideway, or Bazajet Tunnels Limited. So that's the next stage, and then we continue that for another 18 to 36 months, so we as Tideway will continue to operate the system in, in conjunction with Thames, but we're also verifying and optimizing it for another, another, another 18 months to 16, 36 months, sorry. Yeah, where we're, we're looking at that, how the system's performing, optimizing sort of set points, levels, and, and, and if there's anything that needs to be changed, making sure those changes happen before that, that final stage at the end of system acceptance where Thames will be effectively operating that system for the next 120 years at least, or more hopefully. So just, just going back to where we are with the, uh, the activities and the approach for planning. So we, we, we're at currently at the pre-system commissioning stage. We've also started activating the site. So effectively moving the, the, the CSO that would have gone to the river into our new structure. So we've started that in, on, on various sites in Central. So we're now putting stormwater flow through the new interception chamber that were built by the, the civils team. <laughs> okay. Once we've done that and the sites are already, I think the, 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 the next challenge, and I think this is the one that's sort of near end of 2023, early 2024, we're gonna actually connect the two systems up. So removing the, the plug between the Lee Tunnel and connecting the Tideware Tunnel at, at Abbey Mills. So effectively, currently the location of the, the, the I'll call it a concrete bulkhead, it's, it's, a, it's a, a plug between the Lee Tunnel shaft F, which is already constructed and in use, and shaft G where Tideware will come in. So removing that plug effectively joins the, 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 the Tideware Tunnel with the Lee Tunnel becoming the London Tideware Tunnel scheme. And then once we've got that, we can now start putting flows in. So we're now removing temporary flumes, making sure that each site can discharge to the tunnel as and when needed. So we're, 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 we, 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 we approach a stage called system activation. So we're activating the system now, allowing, allowing storm sewage to, to discharge into the tunnel. Okay, and then as I mentioned, storm testing is 
demonstration of fit for purpose. So that's the last phase before we go into the sort of the, the final stages. One of the final stages is we, we've got to do an inspection of the whole system, including the above ground structures, the below ground structures, the shafts, tunnels. And that inspection is effectively the, 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 the walkthrough. I call it a walkthrough, but it could be done by other means remotely or you know through using remote remote operated vehicles, drones, that kind of element. So we, we've got to do a final inspection before the system can be handed over to them. Okay. Uh, so key to key to system commissioning and, and, and I think throughout this whole project we've had very, very good collaboration and collaboration is key. It's not just one party. I think there's a lot of elements in terms of Jacobs, the project management team, Tideway, the client, main roofs and tractors, the system integrator, who are Amy, and then Thames Water, who are cr critical for making sure system commissioning works. And in, in doing all of this, I think the challenge going up forward for, for 2023 is making sure that we've got documentation, the system commissioning plan, which I'll uh, come on to in a minute. And you know we're making sure that all the tests that we're doing at worksite level and in the, in, in the system commissioning period itself have got pass for criteria so we know exactly what we're checking against we're not we're not making it up so all of that's been set up the processes for doing system commissioning the organization who's going to be making the day-to-day -day decisions to go with the test if that test is passed or failed and then and again the decision I think because system commissioning is reliant on getting a, a dry test is probably easy to do but storm we're, we're very very dynamic we're waiting for a storm if that storm occurs, then we, 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 you know, we can we can do the, the the testing that we need for those, that particular storm. We'd want to take it, and then make the decision if that test passed or not there and then sort of thing. So it's quite a quite a sort of a, a, a heavy process. We didn't want to sort of delay missing a storm because unpredictably weather could be. You know, we could get back to back storms, and we could do the testing in hopefully two weeks, or it could be depending on the time of the year when we do this activity, it could be six months, eight months before we get the storm that we need. And then the operational integration is basically getting them comfortable with the system. Their operators are trained to operate the system. So we, we got the sort of the operational integration side of it. I'm gonna pass on to Jane. Thanks, Jad. Uh, don't worry, we're on the home stretch now. It uh, won't be taking too much longer. Uh, my name's James Smith. I'm the Deputy Programme Director at Tideway. Uh, I've been on the programme now nine years, or just over nine years, in this guise. Had various roles through that nine years, but I was also involved back in the very, very early days, early 2000s, in the strategic study. I was the, was the, the project manager for the tr strategic study up to 2005 so uh, always had an interest in this project and always kept an eye on it so uh, I've been very fortunate I've come back and I've been here for nine years seeing it through as well so hopefully another couple of years and I'll, I'll see it to the end so Jan's just talked about commissioning um, we are in that transition phase between sort of heavy civils and moving into the sort of the mechanical electrical in, uh, ICA installation and the architecture and landscaping but there is still some heavy civils to be done. Um, in West, we looked at some very nice pictures of some completed sites, but I think the focus for next year uh, is probably around Carnworth Road. So we've just finished the secondary lining there, but we've now got to fit out that shaft. As you can see from the diagram, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a small task in itself. So a big focus for West is the completion of that, those shaft internals uh, and the mechanical electrical plant and the air treatment unit that's bolted onto the side there. So a big focus in West. Central, um, we've, we're starting to remove the temporary works and we are beginning to see those flows as Jad mentioned. So a few, a few photos there, you can see, see some of the sort of the, the flumes being removed. That's the, the one in the center there. So one of the flumes we've installed in the old basil jet, low level one sewer. Uh, top right hand corner, you can see actually some of the flows being turned, that's at Chelsea. Um, so we used to do, the, the flows used to go through those two, two, two pipes out into the river, through the coffer dam, but now we've turned them through the, through the, new, the new asset and the new um, interception ch chambers. But also we're starting to remove these, the, the temporary in-river work. So the coffer dams are coming out, 
Um, the jetties are being removed, so again, another significant piece of work, but slightly different work again. So with our mind on sort of health and safety, again, different phase, different type of work, so we've got to be very cognizant of that. Whereas in East, we're still in the thick of it. So we've got to complete the secondary lining. Civil works is continuing. Hydraulic structures, ancillary work still need to be done. But we're also doing those micro installations. You can see one of the pen stocks there, um, but also a &L as well. And you had already touched on it. This. We've already seen the sort of the, the, those, those, uh, um, those wall panels going up uh, at, uh, at Kempf. So yeah, very much all of it's to be done in East at some point next year. And then the dreaded paperwork. No construction project is done without any paperwork. So we are working our way through it. Um, before we can move on to Jad's lovely commissioning, we've got to complete the certification, the operation and maintenance manuals, et cetera. Many, many pieces of paper uh, and documents that we are already what on the way to delivering. So it's, that's a key focus for actually as the teams. Uh, we don't want to lose that sort of knowledge that we've built up over the years. Uh, getting to that final phase when we need to need to get all of that paperwork completed and over the line so so we can start commissioning the asset and handing it over to Thames Water. So that's 2023. However, we will beginning to see some of our, I mean, some of these in-river structures that we're completing. This is the one at Putney. Uh, these will all become very, very visible for, for, for the public walking along the river. Um, some amazing structure. So that's Putney. That is the one at Victoria. Again, we saw it being completed, but again, very, very visible part of London. Uh, it's a huge legacy for the project, and it'll be a great amenity for London and the river users. And finally, that's the one outside the MI6 building at uh, Albert. So uh, again, new river foreshore. Um, fantastic amenity, but all of this will be visible to all of us in this room in the next, in the next 12 months. So massive, massive effort from everybody in the team. Uh, it's, been a long, it's been a long project. I mean, most of us have been in many, many, many years, and, and I think that's testament to the, to the project that it is. It's a, it's a great project to work on, and we're getting to this, this final stage. So um, that's it for me. I think we're into to questions now. So I will hand over. Right, thank you all. Thank you to the whole team for that presentation. Um, any questions, please? Could you uh, say your name and your affiliation, please? Thanks, David. Thanks, Bob. Uh, John Davis, Geotechnical Consulting Group. Question for either Jim or James, but it's not about geotechnic, so you can go <laughs> <laughs> um, I've spent a long time seconded into the Crossrail Client Organization, and round about this stage, then the digital data into the public domain. It's a fairly simple thing to do. I've also got the commission um, uh, to upload all the monitoring data, but there were some technical challenges around that, so it hasn't happened. So my simple question to you is, are you going to do the same thing? <laughs> Very good question. Uh, I, I, from a client perspective, I think I, that I think the answer will probably be yes. I mean, one of the major things from Tideway is they want to share everything that's happened in the last goodness knows how many years since 2008. So um, they, 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 they are very, very open um, to sharing everything that's gone before. Uh, they want to improve the industry as a whole. So uh, I don't see why not. Um, so it, there's no reason for it to be retained for, it, for, for, for any other purpose. So yeah, I, I, from, from my perspective, the answer is yes. I can't speak for Tideway, but, uh, but yeah. Another question, Matt? Hello, uh, I'm Clem Richardson. I'm actually on Tideway East as well, I work at Chambers Wharf as a construction engineer and site supervisor. This is actually a question for Kemp, uh, this one. Um, I was just wondering because, so as the addict wasn't actually something that was initially planned, but an engineering solution that was conjured up given the situation at, at hand, um, how do you actually balance the mix between program objectives but also engineering feasibility and find that compromise that is both suitable for contractor client and also on the management side, more for program. 
Um, right, so um, yeah, we didn't plan to build the Adit in the first place. And uh, when we found the need, um, because of the program to um, try to take the shaft from the critical path, um, that's when we had to do the new geotechnical investigation, we had to go to whole design of the Adit to validate it, um, assure ourselves that that is a feasible solution, um, go to the, all the gates of the design gates and uh, eventually um, agree with the consent team and inspector of state whether this is a major or minor amendment to the DCO because we, we cannot forget that the, the route of the tunnel was safeguarded by the, by the consent, planning consent, and that was kind of our biggest fear. Um, that almost happened over a time of a year. Um, by that time, we managed to um, start the works on um, installation of that um, design. Uh, and um, I, I must say that um, back then, Kemp was one of the last sites in East starting to do the um, deep foundation and sinking the shaft. But over the years now, uh, Kempf is the first site uh, along all these sites to build a cover slab. So we managed to catch up and it was really, really a good decision to go and um, overall brought us back where we wanted to be initially. Thank you. Any more questions? Mm -hmm. Back at the back there. Uh, thank you for a very comprehensive presentation, giving a good overview of the entire project. I'm Manoj Burman. I'm a, a rock mechanics and tunneling consultant from India. And visiting London, it's my good fortune that I happened to arrive yesterday. And today, I was able to attend this lovely presentation or series of presentations. Uh, is it, uh, small questions, not, uh, not that relevant to what was presented here, but I'm curious to know, is, do you have any rough idea about the, the cost of investigations, geotechnical investigations, uh, with respect to the, the cost of the, the project, the construction cost? Hmm. I, I don't know offhand. We can, we can definitely find that out. I'm not sure if any... any I can't know. Know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's something we can, if we can come back to you on, if we can... Okay, right. I'm out. very curious to know that if, if I can get, get that information. Thank you very much. Okay. <coughs> yes, Richard uh, Subadon here from Murphy's. Um, one for Jad on the uh, micro and the commissioning. Um, so just thinking, Jad, you've got a lot of good uh, tunnelers on the project and a lot of good civil engineers. And as a civil engineer who thinks of themselves as a tunneler, how do you ensure that those people are also focused on the systems and the mica, such that when it comes through to commissioning, you're in a, you're in a much better place? So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a civil engineer by trade as well, so. <laughs> From a, from a micro perspective, we've got quite a few people who are specifically dealing with the mechanical element, the electrical element, and the controls out of it. Now, when we were putting the, the system commissioning plan in place, we made sure that the, the, the sort of the expertise required for those fields was taken into account, not from just the, the, the so as I was saying, the, the pre-system commissioning period, which is factory and site, but then going forward, how are we going to demonstrate the, 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 those elements being tested so d in developing the plan, we, d we defined detailed tests from the mechanical side, the electrical side, and, and even <coughs> hydraulics as well. We had hydraulic experts. So we've got, we've got that sort of field that just concentrates on system commissioning and pre-system commissioning, system commissioning activities. And I think pulling all of them together and then having them, I wouldn't say, you know, in terms of having them jointly working on the plan from a, from a overall network perspective was quite useful in making sure that we didn't, weren't advertently testing something that could affect their system. So again, getting the, the right element of commissioning managers from Thames, commissioning managers from the MWCs, and, and all of that combined alliance effort to produce the plan was, was what, we'd, what we've done so far. Cheers. Any other questions? Uh, good evening, <coughs> Joe Miller from Kobe. Um, just a quick one to probably everyone apart from Jad, I guess. Um, low carbon concrete, has it come into the conversation at any point? Um, just 
And if so, has anything been done in that manner yet? I believe most of the main works contractors have incorporated low carbon concrete, and I think just also looking at where we can reduce concrete usage. So I think it was in the secondary lining presentation, the original thickness of the secondary lining, uh, certain thickness, we were actually able to reduce that um, for some of the tunnels. So it's, it's been something, I can't speak for all three of the main works contractors, but I'm, I'm pretty certain they, they, they all considered in, in use. We did, we did quite a lot of work to uh, reduce the, the quantity of fibers in the secondary lining mix, which obviously had a, an impact. But the cement replacements, if that's what you're referring to, on the west, we haven't looked at mm. in, in great detail. That 120 year design life is probably a challenge, Tricky. I suspect, on, on low, low, low carbon. Okay. Yeah, and I, I believe oh. that the, in Abbey Mill Pumping Station, there are some trials now about the lower. Um, carbon concrete, so um, not, not in great deal at camp, but um, th there is some definitely good work in that way, and we can investigate more and share with the rest of the industry once we have the trials complete. Okay. Oh. We could add into that, the, the secondary lining thickness across the central and, and east sections would have been reduced from, I think maybe roughly 300 to 250 fibers but in the and that's, that's taken out a fair, fair bit of carbon um, in the other structures where we haven't got such um, high criteria for striking then GGBS in, you know, cement replacement would be focused would be a big part of what the team have been doing and I think from memory of something like uh, 10 or 15 percent of the carbon has been reduced in the detailed design phase from the overall the regional baseline to where we are now The, the permanent structures as well it is regularly shared between the engineers and the engineers and materials people when they are working or on various different structures there is a list of which mixes will have carbon so it, it may not be the only reason why a mix is selected but it, it is there available for us so we can make that choice and then further to that as well a lot of temporary works slabs and platforms we will select low carbon mixes and yeah, like Henry was saying, the materials team on Taiwan East at least is, is conducting various trials to, to continue with that. Uh, further to that as well, communication uh, with the materials team on mixes when we do find they are gaining strength a lot quicker than we do need them to, but yeah, for items probably not so much for Alexi, but for other items, uh, high strength mixes when they do gain that carbon, it, it, they do release more carbon uh, but purely because of their strength. Uh, so yeah, if, if we do find that a mix is getting to 60 Newton in, in 20 days, whereas really we only need it 50 at 28, that is communicated, fed back to the materials team uh, and, and they do uh, take that on board. Uh, hi, um, my name is James de Burdick. I'm, I'm a guest here. Um, you, you mentioned 120 years for your system uh, or plus. Um, how did you work out the population increase um, over that period for London? Well, I, 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 I don't know how he, how it was exactly worked out, but I mean, it was estimated to be, or I, I think it was 60, 60 million. I, th I think it was the, that was the estimate at that point. Um, so, it, I suppose it, looking at um, um, global warming models as well, that's been incorporated into the design um, to the best of our ability at the time. Um, they're always evolving, so yeah, I mean, population growth and 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 certainly sort of climate change <coughs> has been built in and part of that sort of 120 year design line. Okay. Another. Uh, an answer, not a question. John Davis again. So, to our Indian colleague who asked about GI costs, I can give you very rough figures for Crossrail, where the civils, the value of the civils works, this is about 10, 12 years ago, was about four and a half. Questions? Okay, could we thank the uh, presenters? <laughs>
we've, uh, we've got some uh, slides for uh, some future events. If we could put them up, please. Um, and just while we're doing this, um, if you haven't signed the register, please could you uh, sign the register um, so that we can uh, understand the numbers. Could you go? <coughs> right. Uh, going forward, um, we've got drinks. Um, hopefully, well, we've been told definitely it's the uh, last time we're going to have to go around the corner to the Westminster Arms. <laughs> but anyway, round the corner, uh, Westminster Arms, and the uh, drinks tonight are being kindly sponsored by Jacobs. <laughs> 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 so a great thanks to them. Um, going forward, the uh, next meeting of the main BTS will be the 19th of January, an overview of HS2 works preparation for the Bromford Tunnel construction. Um, as I just said, that's the new look bar downstairs and we'll be in there with drinks on the 19th of January. We all look forward to that with the sausage and chips and pasties back as well. <laughs> okay, moving forward. Um, also on the uh, 19th of uh, January is a fibre reinforced concrete workshop being held by the young members. So further uh, information is available on the uh, young members' uh, social media sites. So if you uh, want to register, please do. Then we move on to February, which is our joint meeting with uh, Min South, uh, Kidston Pumped Storage Project from Australia. Uh, then we're moving on to March 16th of not match as it's got up there. Um, it's uh, geopolyb uh, concrete. And then finally, going into April, we've got the Harding Prize. It is still open for applications for anybody under the age of 33. The closing date is the 10th of Feb. Uh, so we would definitely look for uh, people to... Uh, put their applications in, um, there's a, a nice prize and uh, an uh, invite to the, uh, the dinner as well. Moving on to the next slide, which is exactly that, the dinner. We've had to move the dinner, or we decided to move the dinner forward one week. It was planned to be the following Friday, which was going to be the day for the uh, coronation. We felt that that would be a, an issue with accommodation in London. So we've moved it forward a week to the 28th of April. The uh, booking will open on the 1st of February, so please get your fingers ready to get on the buttons to uh, book your tables in uh, February, please. Uh, the 50th book. We have apparently moved from phase one writing to phase two finalising. So we are definitely moving in the right direction to get the book issued. Um, there's various things on there which you can uh, easily read. But what is still available is sponsorship. We are still looking for sponsors. So if you haven't sponsored, there is still time to do so. Ideally by the end of this year, um, there are various levels of sponsorship and various um, acknowledgements that will go in the book depending on the level of your sponsorship. So you can visit the website, uh, the BTS website, to find more out about that. And then finally, um, it's Christmas, or we hope it is in a couple of weeks' time, so for me and uh, the rest of the BTS committee, we'd like to say enjoy your Christmas and we'll see you all in January for the next meeting. And a big thanks for Jacobs and the team here.